Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining this session. Uh, the session title is a behind the scenes look at how Quivarian delivers AI robotics at scale. Today, we will be covering a lot of material, starting with why we do need more intelligent robotics and the technical challenges that have up to this point prevented the autonomy necessary for them to be scaled. We then dive into the most salient elements of Covarian strategy that we believe are the key to cracking this hard but high value problem. Before we proceed, some logistical notes. As you can probably tell, you're listening to a pre-recorded video. I will be present in the chat room, available to answer your questions as they come up during the recording. On that note, let's jump right in. A very quick bio on me. I did my undergraduate and graduate studies at Berkeley, working with Peter Beal in the Bear Lab, for the last four years, I have been at Quivarian working on the computer vision and grasping stacks that help enable our robots to act autonomously in the real world and provide value for our customers. At the current moment, I help lead the new capabilities team, which focuses on medium to long-term research projects that, if successful, could provide large jumps in our technical capabilities. Before we get into what we're doing at Quivarian, it's important to ask the question, where are the robots? So this will, through this, we will understand the strengths and weaknesses of the technical state of traditional robotics today. Let's consider traditional robotic automation. In this category of robots that are actually deployed and operating in the world, we see highly structured environments where pre-programmed and deterministic behaviors do actually get the job done. For example, move joint 5 to 40 degrees and joint 2 to 50 degrees, and then move to this other location, and so on. Once an engineer designs the environment and workflow once, the sa that same process can then be automated, since nothing is unexpected or unknown in these environments. While this has provided incredible value for tons of industries, uh, like the examples from car manufacturing and chip design you see here, we will see that there is an enormous segment of the market that cannot be served by traditional robotic automation. Now contrast the highly structured nature of the previous traditional robotic automation setting with these types of settings instead. These types of tasks illustrate what we actually wish we could do or wish could be automated. Um, and these could lead to numerous economic benefits like helping with labor shortages and freeing up these workers to do less repetitive and undesirable or injury prone tasks. These scenarios don't yet have robots that work in such unstructured environments. Look for, look for example at the packages coming in on the right or the pile of objects dumped in the left image you see right away that predetermined robotic motions won't work here. In other words, where to go or what to do needs to be entirely a function of the system seeing the scene and making sense of what it sees. Given all these sensorial inputs and consequent scene understanding, you need the robot to make intelligent, dynamic plans on how to execute an action that is desirable. Very quickly, you can see that any significant amount of variation in an environment already makes intelligence a requirement. When, we're, when we as humans think about how hard or impressive a task is, it's normal to think of tasks like winning Jeopardy or beating a chess champion or doing backflips as being true intelligence. And we see these types of tasks as being much harder than tasks like cleaning a room or unloading a dishwasher or pushing in a chair. But to this day, there exists no robots that can do anything in the column on our right. Why is that? One way to think about this is to think about the categorization of specialists versus generalists. The simple answer to why are the tasks on the right so hard is the amount of variation that we need to be adaptable and robust to. When unloading the dishwasher, for example, you have to first recognize the range of different items that could be inside, including thousands of types of stemless glasses or mugs or bowls and so on. Not only do the items rarely look the same, but they could also be oriented arbitrarily and even the dishwasher configuration itself changes from household to household. Even after you recognize and choose something, you have to change how you grip it based on its various physical properties, which you don't explicitly know ahead of time. You have to adjust your grip in real time to account for the club, cup spilling, uh, sorry, the cup slipping, or the item being heavier than you expected. You have to do intelligent impedance control in order to pick up delicate things while also able to yank out a fork that might be jammed. And if all that wasn't hard enough, you still have to reliably put these items away, which involves reorienting the items in your hand without dropping, precisely placing them to where they belong without breaking them, and so on. The deeper you think about this, the more you realize that almost every element of this task is frankly an unsolved research problem. This, often refer, this is often referred to as Moravec's paradox, 
well, which I personally interpret as the phenomena of robotic researchers in their effort of designing generalist robots coming to be amazed at the offhand intuitive intelligence humans and animals demonstrate in day-to-day -day life. Let's start by thinking about the question of where can we find generalist robots in the world? Where exactly are they? And what are they doing? Market penetration of robots that address tasks that involve feet is quite deep, with many of the technical challenges already solved. On the left-hand side, you see pocket sorters that help automate the flow of apparel and warehouses. Below that, conveyors which act as the equivalent for parcels, e-commerce, and much more. On the more generalist side, one common paradigm is the fleet of robots on wheels carrying things around the warehouse in accordance to a system-level planner. These robots are often fitted with depth sensors like LiDAR to perceive unexpected blockers in front of them. These blockers are examples like workers, um, and these robots often have the ability to halt, alter their plan slightly to avoid the obstacle, and then converge back to the original plan. Now note the stark contrast with hands. Any element that involves dexterity and complex interaction with a scene are often still beyond the reach of the best automation solutions on the market. When we started the company, we initially overlooked this space because there are a lot of companies working on automating hands. Quickly, however, we realized that 30-second online demos do not an autonomous robot make. Current solutions fell into two buckets based on our research. One, handling a narrow slice of highly structured environments with minimal allowed whitelisted items um, that the robot was expected to handle, or a robot that needed so much bot tending that the business value to the consumer vanishes. The best way to understand is to dig into an example. So I'll walk you through one such example in a high automation warehouse. Warehouses can receive hundreds of thousands or millions of products from manufacturers, and they need to send these products directly to customers' homes and to store, stores across this country, fulfilling millions of orders each week. To coordinate and meet this demand, some of these large warehouses have automated parts of their pipeline. What's illustrated here is called auto store technology. These robots on wheels drive around the tracks on top and retrieve the tote corresponding to the object that needs to be selected for sending out to customers. This part of the process is fully automated because this is a perfect example of what will be introduced as a specialist. The specialist technology operates autonomously because pre-programmed logic is enough to travel to the tote within, with a desired item and pick up the tote which is always um, in a, uh, which, which always has a pre-configured size and shape and is in a set location. These auto-stored robots then send these totes to the human stations below, where instead of working with fixed totes, the individual items themselves need to be handled now. The human employees then take the goods out of the selected inventory totes and place them in an order sh uh, shipping box or send them to wherever they need to go next. This is often referred to in the industry as a goods-to-person system. Again, contrasting the specialist system on the left, where everything was automated because of the highly structured environment, with the more generalist system on the right, we see a compelling challenge. The items and scenes themselves have a high degree of variability, as shown from the few examples here. Moreover, exactly how you pick things up and how you transport them or what you do with them afterwards is also entirely determined by dynamic reasoning, as a function of what the robot actually perceives, how that matches up to its experience, and the unique plan it generates. This is exactly an example of a problem that Quivarian works on. With that background in place and the challenges a bit more clear, in this presentation, we wanted to define autonomy with respect to AI robotics and what approach one should take to achieve autonomy that is scalable. In other words, how do we scale to hundreds or, or thousands of robots that are autonomous? At Quivarian, we define autonomy with respect to one prime metric, mean time between operator intervention. Note that this is conditioned on robots being capable of handling enough for a work such that in the case of little to no intervention, it's still adding value to a customer. Otherwise, you can imagine a degenerate scenario, scenario where one promises and delivers a robot that does not need bot tending, but also handles such a narrow subset of items that it proves useless. Here we focus on two related concepts, savings and throughput. One variable labor cost associated to an AI robotic solution is the amount of work asked of a bot tender. They come in and correct where the robot gets into an error or is unsure of what to do. Hopefully it's clear that the labor savings from automation only come if a bot tender can scale to many robots. Now consider throughput. If the robot is constantly in an error state and on each error that takes a long time to resolve, the time the robot is actually working gets cut drastically. This loss in throughput often results in the robot not being economically feasible to the customer. 
Over these last four years, we have found there are four main areas to focus in to achieve this autonomy in a way that is scalable. As we will see throughout this presentation, scalability is a critical concept. If each AI robotic station or solution takes a large amount of R&D or general labor hours to get to a deployable state, the business case evaporates. These are the, and these pillars are composability, self and semi-supervised learning, simulation, and optimizing for inference. Let's dive in. We start our journey at the beginning. Hopefully I've convinced you the problem we're trying to solve is valuable and that existing solutions come short. But the next question is, well, what system do we want to design and how do we do it? Composability will be our key. Let's contrast composability with the main vein of, a of recent AI and ML literature, which is a focus on end-to-end -end and model-free learning. In other words, the designer should play a minimalist role. There are just system inputs and desired outputs with one monolith machine learning model in between. Before we jump into challenges, let's acknowledge the strengths here. Because the researcher puts no structure in, they're also not imparting any bias to the system. For example, in canonical RL literature, for tasks like OpenAI Jim Walker, with very well-defined rewards, with enough interactions, um, a model-free approach will exceed the performance of a model-based one. However, the limitations, I believe, outweigh this benefit, especially since in a complex environment, having either tons of interactions or effective, for effectively free or a simple reward function are not practical. End-to-end -end models are brittle to any modification. If you specify a new task, typical architectures will not generalize elegantly. Often you will need to retrain from scratch or even re-architect your model. End-to-end -end models can be, de uh, by definition, lack interpretability. If you have some model failure, you can't do introspection to figure out why it occurred. This makes triaging much more difficult. Similar in theme to the first bullet point, with the near infinite variability of the real world, you will have to you have elements in the test distribution that look very different from training. Model-free approaches tend to struggle more than other paradigms in such contexts. With the RL scoping of the problem, you often need heavy reward shaping to achieve complex behaviors. At a certain point, the complexity of the reward becomes untenable. Thus, from our experience, model-free approaches frankly are only able to solve simple tasks in the real world. At Covariant, we have taken the approach towards solving AI robotic autonomy by creating a platform on which we develop high-quality, hardened skills that can interconnect relatively seamlessly. Consider a human with this abstraction. We decompose our autonomy to a set of base competencies, i.e. the ability to read, to perceive depth, object recognition, behavior prediction of the environment, etc. In the context of AI models, you have several advantages. You can utilize more dense supervision to train the collective system. For example, while the end-to-end -end task might be picking and placing objects, and thus you have a sparse end-to-end -end reward signal, an object detection module can be trained through annotation of perceptual inputs, or even leverage existing public data sets for bootstrapping. An oft-overlooked advantage is a composability-based approach allows for researchers to have more clear mandates and step on each other's toes less. This is because one can iterate quite quickly on a particular skill without disrupting another researcher's work as long as the API between modules remain the same. Most importantly, we think AI robotics can only be successful if we generalize elegantly and without much work to many more tasks and many more jobs that humans will expect of robots. I hope to show you over the next several slides how this works here at Covariant. Before we show the generalizability benefit of composability, let's first discuss how we even compose our system in the first place. Note, this is a high-level overview. For more details, you will have to just come join us at Covariant. Recall that we have a robot picking from a tote, conveyor, shoot, etc. Above this picking area is a camera rig that we use to do perception and scene understanding. The reason for this camera rig not being on the robot arm, we will talk about later. We first capture from all the cameras and pass each image independently through a backbone network and a lightweight FPN. In our case, we use ReginET as the backbone for its balance between latency and performance. Then, at every spatial scale, we fuse the feature maps from all the camera views into one set of feature maps that have a much richer context and can power the downstream modules. We then derive a 3D representation of the scene and further fit existing meshes saved in our layout to the predicted point map. 
Furthermore, we derive all the objects present in the picking area. We further predict more things about the objects, like their 3D geometry and other pertinent attributes. We also track objects across scenes so we can carry context and experience from prior interactions to the current one. Taking all this scene context together, we pass to a grasping policy that predicts the best grasps. We then derive the best trajectory to take the selected object to the desired destination. At the trajectory, as the trajectory is executing, we are also make live adjustments based on the sensor feedback like weight, suction gauges, etc. As a case study, let's go over some of these modules more in depth to see how a composability-oriented system designed for robotic picking and placing of objects can be extended to enable new use cases for free. We have found one of the most important modules to be object detection. The whole point of piece picking is that you can singulate objects successfully. That means picking up exactly one object, and to do that, you need to know what and where the objects are. We very quickly realized the current public state-of-the-art was not good enough for us. Most object detection work happens in relatively sparse scenes with minimal occlusions and overlaps. Examples are in MS Coco, pedestrian datasets, and autonomous vehicle datasets. As you see from the examples above, we often are faced with incredibly clustered scenes of hundreds of objects, many of which, high, um, many of which highly occlude each other. Looking at the model predictions, I want you to notice several things. At the highest level, simply note the quality of the predictions on these incredibly hard scenes. I often find that the model does a better job than I can at distinguishing objects. The model does not often, uh, the model does not only predict the visible portions of the object masks, it also imagines the extent of the invisible portions as well. We call these the visible and full masks, with the bounding box supervised to be the minimal enclosing box around the full mask. By having these two predictions, we can do powerful things like properly centering and placing a picked object, which only has a small side exposed prior to grasping it. We can also derive object stacking order, which is, quite powerful, which is a quite powerful input for a grasping policy. One of the principles of automation and labor uh, in a warehouse is singulation. And uh, most downstream processes depend on this being done properly. If, if it, it is thus high value to have a vision system that is just downstream of the singulation cells, either human or robot powered, double checking if the singulation was successful. Trained on millions of warehouse items and with a state-of-the-art architecture, our object recognition model is quite powerful in this regard, and in and of itself is a valuable product for many clients. Consider this example where a customer mounted several of our vision systems over their conveyor belt, our system flagging all detected singulation errors. This proved to be quite valuable to the customer, who could proactively resolve these silent errors before they caused harm to the downstream process. Here you can visualize a random sample of 100 such errors. Let's switch gears to another valuable module, 3D understanding. As many in this audience know, almost all robotics applications need to have some 3D understanding of the world around them. When starting this company, we had thought, we had thought this problem solved by traditional industrial depth sensors. We bought and evaluated the best sensors across all common modalities such as LiDAR, active stereo, and structured light. Despite being almost prohibitively expensive, these sensors failed spectacularly on a variety of non-Lambertian services, which are often occurrences in a warehouse. Consider the simple example of this plastic water bottle. A traditional sensor failed catastrophically on it. We have found learning-based approaches to be the only way to robustly predict depth and have pushed past the public state-of-the-art in terms of accuracy here. Note that while the water bottle, a very hard object, is not perfectly predicted by the model, the model's best attempt is still quite good. Building on top of both object recognition and 3D reconstruction, we have found it valuable to directly model object dimensions as well. From a picking perspective, this knowledge is invaluable for grasping and placing. Taking object recognition, 3D reconstruction, and 3D object geometry, we have created an auxiliary product referred to as Lighthouse. Often warehouses don't have accurate information about their object dimensions, which is critical for determining outbound package size, how many items to keep in a tote, whether an object is robot pickable, etc. For such customers, we sell the same camera system used for robotic picking and output the proper dimensioning data for the SKUs in the tote. SKU being an acronym for Stock Keeping Unit, the industry lingo for a distinct type of item in inventory. This avoids needing very manual and error-prone human-measured labels, a system that does not scale for a warehouse with millions of SKUs. I only had time to get into two example use cases enabled by our platform beyond the original robotic order picking task, 
But I want to give passing recognition that there are many more use cases built on top of the same fundamental skills we have developed. Now that we have explained how we architect our models, i.e. a composability approach, the next question you might be asking is how do we train them? Let's first make clear that vanilla supervised learning does not work at scale. Consider just one canonical robot station. While these numbers can vary across use cases, 1,000 picks per hour is often expected of a robot. Across all the cameras in our system over a pick and place, we often capture from around 10 cameras. In a typical two-shift warehouse, we operate 16 hours a day. Let's assume that the warehouse and robot are active 300 days a year. That's a grand total of 48 million images per year for just one robot station. Now, with just hundreds of robots, you're generating billions of images per year. Orienting your modeling approach purely around human labels and annotations will simply not scale. One way we will address this problem is by utilizing self and semi-supervised learning as much as we can. To do this, we rely on adding high quality sensors to the robotic system so that it can effectively teach itself. Let's go over a handful of examples. Given our use of suction-based end effectors, suction gauge readings are quite important to us. Knowing if a suction cup has sealed and established vacuum lets us know if a grasp has succeeded or not. Consider the visualized grasp on the long, thin, purple boxoid. Green means the cups were intended to be used. Yellow means that they were not turned on by the policy. Notice the sun looking pattern in the middle. Each of those rays is actually a hole over which a cup cannot seal. Indeed, when we tried this grasp in production, the top green cup sealed and the bottom one did not. A simple but powerful idea is to supervise a model to predict whether a cup will seal or not using the suction gauge as the labeler. In this example, the learned model was able to roughly capture the real life occurrence. This learned component has proven a powerful part of our grasping stack, helping to decrease grasp failure rates. Notice that we can learn from every single pick across all our robots at all the various deployments using this method. Now say we have a grasp that is deemed successful. Our job is not yet done. The robot needs to transport and place the object without dropping it in transit. At the system level, we need to be able to dynamically modulate speeds based on the grasp object trajectory combination. Otherwise, the robot would need to always travel at the rate required by the most adversarial combination of settings. The hit to PPH or picks per hour would be so great that the robot is no longer valuable to customers. At the same time, dropping an object will need a human intervention to pick up the fallen object and put it in the desired location. Too many such instances result in an unmanageable bot tender to robot ratio and decreases in robot throughput. Elements we have discussed before that result in loss of autonomy. The solution here is once again a learn module. Using the same suction gauges, but now reading their value after placement, we can train a model similar to the previous one, with a caveat that it also takes the trajectory as input. As an example, look at this GIF of a robot dropping an object. In this case, the robot trajectory was executed at speed 1000. Speed here refers to the velocity of the TCP. The units here are millimeters per second. The learn model outputs for the scene are below, with its associated high probability drop uh, for speeds 1000 and above, and relatively low probability of drop for rates 800 and below. According to the model, we should have probably moved at speed 800. Now let's consider a different sensing modality, in this case, force sensors. It's important to first realize that scene recognition cannot only rely on vision. For example, weight is often ambiguous. However, weight plays a big part in determining how you want to move the object and how fast. We have thus added various force sensors to our end effector, in particular load cells and an IMU. Load cells are force transducers. They map the amount of force applied to them linearly to an electric signal that can be measured. IMUs detect linear acceleration and angular velocities. Together with the robot trajectory and speed, we can derive the weight of the object during the placing motion. Note that this handcrafted method relies on a long series of readings from all the pertinent sensors because they're often noisy and slow. This gets us into a chicken and egg problem. Knowing the weight near the end of the motion does us little good. The trajectory and speed it's supposed to modulate have already mostly occurred. Turning to learning based approaches once more, we have successfully been able to learn models that given both our perceptual as well as sensorial inputs 
predict the weight early on in the trajectory. We supervise the model using the future, since offline, we have the, we've access to the entire sensorial, sensorial sequence from the pick and place um, to use as supervision. The result is weight as a weight prediction model that is quite robust and more prescient than the handcrafted approach and is a valuable part of our system. Moving on from self and semi-supervised learning, let's talk about simulation, which is another important way we train and evaluate our models. Self and semi-supervised learning is necessary but not sufficient. Why do I say this? Well, for one, learning through experience is not always an option. Consider a self-driving car that through some predictive mistake of a model results in a bodily harm to riders or pedestrians. Or in a warehouse, if the robot is expected to learn from scratch, you have a catch-22. The robot is not good enough to provide value and thus the customer does not want it installed. But if you only rely on self and semi-supervised learning, you need experience to improve. Thus, such an approach to AI robotics can find itself in a deadlock. Another reason why we need simulation is that for some of the robotic skills we want to learn, real-world data is not a good fit. Uh, we'll go through an example later that illustrates this. Simulation is not an easy panacea, however. It has one main challenge often referred to as the sim to real gap. The symptom is that models which perform well in simulation will often behave poorly in real life. The main reason behind this is quite simple to explain, but hard to solve. Simulators do not perfectly represent the real world, and thus we have very different training and evaluation distributions. For simulators to be effective, we need to invest in having more realistic rendering and physics. To illustrate the points made in the prior two slides, let's consider 3D reconstruction. In this domain, real-world datasets are incredibly expensive to collect. A quick survey of the literature shows that they're often limited to less than 100 examples per dataset. Consider the image below, which represents the workflow for collecting examples from a Middlebury dataset. The camera and lighting setup mimics the complexity of a movie set. Further, the item distribution is limited to whatever your data sensor can handle. In the Middlebury example, they have to first capture a normal image with the RGB sensors, then spray the motorcycle with a product that makes the service more Lambertian, and then capture with a depth sensor. It should be clear that such an approach is neither scalable or practical for many use cases, including ours. On the flip side, current public simulated datasets are not a good fit either. They are often highly unrealistic from a rendering perspective, and or wildly out of distribution for AI robotics. To properly train a 3D reconstruction model that works well in the real world, we have found the need to generate our own simulated datasets that surpass the current state of the art in rendering quality, object diversity, and scene and camera layout diversity. But a picture is worth a thousand words, as they say. So let's play a little game. For the next couple slides, specifically five examples, Guess if the image is simulated or from a real camera at one of our deployment stations. After the fifth example, type in the chat which you think are real and which are simulated. Okay, here's example one. I'll give you 10 seconds to look at each. And finally, example five. Remember, put your predictions on which are real and which are simulated in the chat below. Surprise, they're all simulated. Kudos to those of you who got it. As I hope it's clear from the examples, we have pushed hard to get as photorealistic and authentic a simulated environment as possible. We have found investments in this direction critical in bridging the sim to real gap for our 3D reconstruction models. 
I would even say the quality of data set is more important than whether your model has all the latest bells and whistles. We're by no means done yet when it comes to simulation. Some important next steps include automating object mesh and texture generation that we use for simulation. One idea is to have a workflow where a bot tender collects many camera captures of the object in various poses. Using this data, generating a photorealistic 3D mesh and associated texture will be invaluable. In particular, it will help us scale our already large data set by many orders of magnitude. Finally, we want to pair this impressive rendering capability with equally good physics that correctly model object-to-object -object and robot-to-object interactions. With that, we can test and train even more of our stack in simulation. Now that we have described how we compose our models, as well as how we train them, we finally get to the last pillar, how we use them during inference. To begin, it's important to understand there are two types of time constraints present for our system. While the examples I will give are specific to our problem taxonomy, I hope you can see that the general themes here extend to most problems in AI robotics. The first category is what I call semi-real-time, or open loop. In our use case, we mount a camera rig above the picking area that is not attached to the robot. This allows us to start planning for the next pick the moment the robot arm exits the bin with the current item. The time buffer we have for planning is determined by the robot's speed and stroke length. Thus, the more PPH required by a customer, the smaller this buffer often is. As an example, say we have a 1200 PPH requirement. That means we have 3 seconds per cycle. Let's assume that for 2 seconds, the robot is occluding the bin, and thus we have only 1 second of buffer to perceive and plan for the next pick. If we take longer than that, the robot will be left stalling as it waits, which is a waste of throughput. In the example Gantt chart, blue is perception and planning, green is the robot picking the object, and yellow is transportation and placement. For the sake of visualization, let's say the bin is unincluded the moment the green section ends. Since the blue segment is shorter than the yellow segment, we never have the robot stall in this example pipeline setup. The much harder category is what I call strict real-time or closed loop. Operations like scanning after picking, mid-air doubles detection, AI-powered weight estimation, all block downstream system logic and thus strictly add to robot cycle time. We want to drive the latency on these as close to zero uh, since any time saving directly improves throughput. Given these timing constraints, we have found it critical to have the servers on the edge um, such that they're co-located with the robot. Thus, we can send sensorial and perceptual inputs to the server almost immediately, as well as quickly respond to the robot on what to do. When it comes to latency, our general solution approach is pretty simple. Put everything on the GPU. Often people think only of vision models as candidates for GPU acceleration. However, there are many more such candidates. Examples include image demosaicing and processing, custom CUDA kernels for non-standard operations, often saving memory and time, feature massaging and computation, and trajectory generation are all good candidates for the GPU because an implementation can take advantage of the massive parallelism offered by these devices. At the end of the day, the vast majority of inference time is indeed model related. So we've invested a lot of resources in improving their latency. Often with these sort of things, there is a consideration to be had of how much engineering time it takes to get some latency improvement. Here are some of the learnings that we have found to be most impactful relative to their implementation cost. First off, JIT trace and script everything. This advice is clearly PyTorch centric, and we use PyTorch for everything here at Covariant. From our experience, this gives you a nearly free 10% improvement across the board. Under the hood, this is basically compiling your Python code into C++, as well as doing some graph optimization and kernel fusion. Next up is float 16 inference. Often you can take a model trained in single precision and run it in half precision with only a minimal performance penalty. We found this to be much easier to get working than U8 quantization, especially for non-standard model architectures. If you can, use TensorRT as your inference environment. It has a bunch of benefits like layer and tensor fusion, kernel auto-tuning, dynamic tensor memory, and multiple stream execution. From our experience, the benefits varies based on their model. In the best case, we have had more than half the inference time. 
At a system design level, maintain a model zoo that allows you to trade off latency and performance. Different use cases have different latency requirements on the robot and accuracy needs on the models. Make it easy for downstream solutions engineers to pick and choose based on the product needs. And finally, the easiest option is often simply to upgrade your hardware. As an example, we saw, the, we saw that upgrading from an RTX 6000 to an RTX A6000 improved latency on 3D models by an incredible 40%, a huge win on latency with no R&D effort required. To summarize, today we discussed the state of AI robotics and the four most important pillars we here at Covariant think are necessary to enable autonomy at scale in this space. Before I close, it's important to recognize that the work I presented here today is thanks to the entire team here at Covariant. And if you're curious to learn more and help us in our mission to enable the next generation of AI robotics, please come join us. We're always hiring exceptional people. Thank you for bearing with me as I rushed to cover as much as I could in my allotted time. I hope you found it valuable or at least somewhat interesting. Uh, now let's proceed with live Q&A on this chat. Looking forward to talking to you all live. Goodbye.